name anyway. <laughs> How y'all doing? Welcome to South Carolina, Jason. Thank you. Home of my family, by the way. I'm, all my folks are from the Palmetto State. All my folks from Columbia and Orangeburg and Aiken and all the other part. Nieces and Springfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All day. Right. Get that hometown welcome. Of course. Yeah. So we're going to proceed with um, some questions that you all submitted through the Eventbrite uh, registration. We tried to put as many of those in as possible for our conversation. And then we'll also do a half an hour, hopefully, Q&A with some of our younger audience members. All right. Let's do it. All right. So tell me, how did you first meet Miles Morales? What media did you find him? You want the true story? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So... I had no idea who Miles Morales was. This is, ah, uh, goodness. The first one came out five, six years ago, I think now. I got a phone call from Marvel, which is like weird, you know what I'm saying? Like it's like, that, that alone is, is like a strange moment. And, then, and they basically are like, look, we want you to do uh, a novelization of this character, this, this newish character that we have that we're trying to get to like really go. His name is Miles Morales, never heard of him. I'm like, who's Miles Morales? They're like, well, you know, it's basically this is black, black Spider-Man. And I was like, it's a black Spider-Man? Right, I'm gonna have this one. <laughs> but at the time, I think I was working on a long way down. And so I was sort of like, yeah, I got some other things happening that I really kind of get right, right? I'm like, I need to make sure that this book is good. I don't know if I'm interested. And the truth is, as I told you back there, I didn't necessarily, well, not necessarily, I did not grow up a comic kid. So I was a little bit nervous because I got a lot of respect for people who love the comics and I know how intense they can be about <laughs> about their characters. And so I was sort of like, I don't know. And what ends up happening is I go to a, a school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, I'm doing a school visit, talking to a bunch of kids. And before I leave, the teacher is like, listen, before you walk out the door, we got like six or seven of these black boys in, in, in school suspension. And it would be a shame for you to walk out of here and just not poke your head in and just give them some, some encouragement, right? And I'm like, of course, of course, of course. So I go into the room and they're all in there with their packets. Anybody over there at ISS, you know you get your packet and you get your packet. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, you know, we're having a conversation, we're laughing and joking. And one of the kids says, well, what you working on? I said, you know, the funny thing is, I got this call from Marvel maybe like two weeks ago. And uh, they want me to do this Miles Morales thing. All the kids say, who's Miles Morales? Right? He was not a famous character yet. Who's Miles Morales? I say, yo, so I was told that he's like, you know, it's like Black Spider-Man. And he's from Brooklyn. And then they all like get wide-eyed and they lean forward. They're like, yo, he like from the hood. He gonna wear Jordans. He gonna do this. He, right? It's like, they're like, you know, because of that moment, they're, they're thinking to themselves like, oh snap, like he's gonna be like, like us. And I walk out of the building and I make the phone call and I say, I'll take the gig. So that's how it all started, you know? And then they were like, you gotta come in here and tell us what you wanna make, but that's a whole other story. So we know you have love for Miles. Yeah. Any other uh, characters in the Marvel Universe you'd love to explore? You know, I don't, uh, for me, that, oh. <laughs> I think about my mother, just, just banging on something, right? <laughs> it's wild. Uh, I think um, if, if there's only one other character that I, would, that I would probably explore, and it would be Wolverine. I think, you know, when I think of Wolverine, I think of, uh, of every black uncle I ever had. <laughs> right? It's like, you don't really trust the government because they done tampered with you a little bit. And, uh, this is probably the last time I'm being easily, by the way. <laughs> 
Sometimes you got a little pent up rage, right? But it's warranted rage, right? But it's like a warranted anger, right? You got a reason to be mad, but you haven't figured out how to process your emotion. Right? Wolverine, Logan need a therapist, right? Like he need like this is a real thing. When you really think about that character, right? It's like this is a this is a man who has every reason to be upset and and to not trust any system around him, and really just needs like some therapy and needs like some healing, right? But he also is invincible. And for me, it's like, yeah, sound about right. right? In my mind, I'm like, mm, that would be interesting to kind of fool around with. I don't know if I'll ever do it. I don't know if I could take the heat from the public, right? But but it's somebody should do it. I think it's an interesting way to sort of rethink about um, about that particular character. And now that I've said it, you should all go and like revisit it. You'll be like, yo, this this is interesting in a lot of ways when it comes to culturally what what that could look like if we did sort of adjust it a little bit to see what that would be like if he's if he's a black Vietnam vet. Like, what does that look like then? Right? You come home from the war and your life mentally and emotionally is completely different and your life socially hasn't changed at all. And your anger is like, think about that, right? But you have a way to fight back and it shows itself when you're enraged, but it's not always healthy. You know, ruins your family dynamic. Like this is because this is what was happening to us. You know, blowing up your family because you can't control or get a grip on your feelings, right? You get ill and it's no fault of your own. You did what you were supposed to do trying to serve your country, right? Like that would be an interesting way to think of, of, of Wolverine. And then the fact that his name is Wolverine, which I think is complicated, right? Because he's not a feral animal. Right? He's not a feral animal, right? What he is, is a human being forced to do what is necessary to survive. I don't know. I would read that book. <laughs> Okay, so tell us a little bit about your journey. Mm. When did you know you were going to be a writer? I, you know what? I, most days I'm still not sure. <laughs> I think it's a, writing is a, um, there's nothing more triggering to your insecurities than for you to decide to be a writer for a living or for a hobby or for a passion, right? If you, if you choose that, if you say writing is your thing, then you basically are choosing to get in the, to get in the mud pit with your insecurities every single day. And so it's complicated for me most times, you know? I think I was a, I was a 10 year old though when, when I found it. The greatest thing I ever found, the greatest thing that ever found me, saved my life. Young man going through uh, all sorts of upside downs in his life at that moment. Daddy's gone, you know, parents split. My dad was a good man, I wanted to put on record. You know, every time we tell stories about parents splitting and fathers sort of being absent for a moment, whatever the circumstances may be, we sometimes create villains that aren't actually there. My daddy wasn't no villain, he was a good man. He just was young and he was a human and he had to work some things out and we had to work some things out, right? But at that particular time of my life, it was tough. Uh, at the same time, because my dad's gone and I'm about to go to middle school, my mom is like, I don't know, I need to figure out how to keep this kid out the street. I'm gonna send him to a Catholic school, which was wow for me because I was not a kid who was a private school kind of kid. But here I am, right? I got a uniform on, pants getting a little short, I'm dealing with all of that, right? Like if you, you know, it's like, I wanna put on my sneakers, I wanna wear what, I, what we're wearing in the neighborhood and I gotta walk back down the street. My friend's like, bro, you got on a suit, right? It's like, I'm going through like, you know, you gotta go through all of that. And then my, my grandmother dies on top of all of that. Uh, and it's the first time I heard my mama cry, which is, you know, for those of you in the room who've ever experienced that, it's like a weird, visceral, chemical reaction in your body the first time you hear the giant of your life broken in half, right? Cause she lost her mother. Right, and to hear my mom weeping through the wall is a thing I will never forget as a 10 year old. And then rap music had a chokehold on me. Mm. And I was reading the lyrics of all my favorite rappers at the time, this would have been 92. You know, so we talking about like, Latifah is owning the world, right? We talking about, you know, I think, um, I got an older brother, so he listening to Run DMC and Public Enemy and NWA. And you got early Tribe Called Quest, they're about to happen, right? You got like, oh, this is, you know, salt and pepper's going crazy at the time. And I'm reading the rap lyrics and I'm falling in love with the way that they're communicating and it's all just poetry to me, even though they're not teaching me this stuff in school. 
right? But I'm realizing that these are teenage, these are your LL Cool J, he's like a genius. I'm like, this, this is amazing, I wanna do this. I don't wanna rap it, but I wanna write words like this. And so I use that to sort of help to console my mom. So this is like the perfect storm. This has happened a few times in my life with my career, right? This was the beginning though. A perfect storm, a convergence of events that, that sort of put me in position to find something that, that might just be salvific to me when it comes to my mental and emotional state. Language would be the thing to set me free. Language would be these 26 letters. There's a tattoo on my hand, right? It's the number 26. 26 letters, right? I got, to build a, I got to build a fortress for myself with these 26 letters. I got to build a castle for myself with these 26 letters. I got to build a therapist's office with these 26 letters. I got to build all of the freedom that I've ever experienced in my life just because I fell in love and, and learned how to use 26 letters, right? And that's how it all began for me, a little 10-year-old boy. Mm. Thank you. What your daily writing process looks like, mm. and does that change depending on you're working on prose, you're working on... No, you know what, I'm super, I'm a stickler, I'm very like disciplined. Um, when it comes to that, it doesn't change, except for when I'm traveling, right, which is a lot of the time these days. But I get up at 6.30, 7 o'clock every day and have been for the last 25 years, every day. I'm up, uh, there's coffee, like I'm very regimented. There's coffee, there's the New York Times, there's like, I, I usually try to get some exercise in, and by 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock, I'm, I'm sitting down and I'm doing my work. I write most of my books, uh, long hand, right, in a notebook with a pen. Uh, for all the old heads in here, I know you're very proud of me. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you why uh, really quickly. The reason why is because, um, and for all the young people, and by young people I mean for all the 40, for all the 40 in that 40 range, right? All the old millennials, <laughs> right? The, the, top of the, the top of the millennial chart. The, 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 my biggest fear is that we will be the first generation that will not have an archive, an actual archive. When we're gone, no one will know our handwriting because we haven't written any letters. We haven't, right? There'll be no documents, no documentation. Our handwriting is your, this is your true fingerprint. Right, this is the, they, we won't have it. Everyone will just be writing, everyone will be Times New Roman. <laughs> everyone will be, will be auto-corrected. <laughs> Think about that, right? We will have no, no one will actually know anything about like the, the chemistry of who you are because we will never see any documentation of it. It's all gonna be digital and weird and we gotta print out photographs and then don't be every now and then write do like the old folks say, send a thank you card. Send out them old them old folks was getting it, they understood, like send out them Christmas cards and all that stuff they do every year, right? I'm at that age now I'm like, hey Ma, you know what you I, 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 every every Saturday I sit and I write letters to all kind of people. Some of my friends who live right down the street, send them postcards, you know what I mean, saying silly stuff, you know what I mean? Made it home from easily, right? <laughs> Made it back safe, you know? <laughs> no, but, but, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, at the end of the day, so I write, I write in my notebooks and I, I do that for about six to seven hours. And then, pre-pandemic, and now I'm getting back into it, I usually walk around the corner to the movie theater and go watch whatever is playing at the time. I just walk on in, buy a ticket to whatever happens to be playing, and I sit in there and watch two hours of some film. Hopefully it's good, and even if it's not, it's like a way for me to just like, it's like a cool down period, basically. I do that every single day, right? That's it, you know, Monday through Friday. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of the process. And I don't really play about it. People know not to call me. Like, I'm not gonna answer unless you my mama don't call my phone. Like, I'm super, like, if you at work, I'm at work too. Right? right? And this sort of what I'm doing for the day. And, and uh, it's, it's, I'm religious about it in that way, which is why there's so much work being made. Is because I do that every single day. And over time, you just, you proliferate quite a bit just because it's happening so often, you know? It's not magic, it's just work. You know, it's just a lot of work, yeah. All right, so we're sitting in a library. Mm -hmm. Best place. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the widespread book bans that are taking over the country? My thoughts are we must be we must be doing something right. <laughs> uh, 
you know, it, it, it's it baffles me though. It's it's so strange, honestly. Like it's weird to me. Um, I, I have so many questions about it just because I'm like, are we are we banning um, are we banning their video games? Okay. You know, are we gonna ban YouTube and TikTok? And, are we uh, are we banning music? And it's a fascinating thing that the book is the thing that is that they fear the most. And I've been thinking about why that is, you know. And I don't know if I have an exact answer, but I, I often think about like the the ability to reference a thing. I think I think literature, language has a way of sort of crystallizing and and, and, and sort of fossilizing in the body a very different way. The only other thing I think that does that in this way is is or greater than this actually is music, right? Music sort of it lodges itself in the brain in an interesting way. But I think if you can read something, this is why another thing where, where I think we're kind of missing the mark, and this is also for the older millennials. I think another thing I will encourage us to do is much like the old folks had to do, the older folks had to do when they were in school. We should memorize things. We should memorize our literature. Find you a poem or two a year to just memorize. Find you a cut, an excerpt out of a book to memorize. It's something different and, and something, something happens to you when language gets in the body, when it's in your psyche, right? When it becomes a part of who you are. I think that's what they're afraid of. That's what's so frightening, I think, about the whole book thing, right? It's like, okay, it's not just about if my kid reads this book and now all of a sudden has questions that I know I do not have the capacity to answer. Uh, it's more about what if my kid reads this book and believes themselves to be bigger? What if my kid reads this book and recognizes that they're actually that they actually are the giants, that they actually are the most human amongst us? What if my kid reads this book and now knows that daddy might be a racist? Right? Doesn't mean he can't love daddy, but he got some questions, and he's willing to push back. He's willing to push back and say, "I, I disagree." What happens if all you know, like my mama used to say, the tough part about raising a child to be a leader? Right, which is what we all say we want, by the way. We throw it around so cavalierly, telling our babies, don't be a follower. If John John jump off the bridge, you gonna do it too? <laughs> we don't want you to be a follower without ever taking into consideration that that would mean that at some point they won't follow you. And either you will stand on your word or you'll be made a hypocrite. And what we're seeing is hypocrites. And, and the reason they're being hypocritical has nothing to do with these babies and everything to do with their own fear. My belief is that you only take from people what you do not have. If I were to go to a store and rob the store, I would rob the store for the things that I do not possess. That is why I am taking them from the store. And so the only, the only thing that I could think about in terms of why they are stealing opportunity, intellectual promise, from our young people is because they do not have it themselves. Amen. What do you have to say to the critics who say that your books are <laughs> too real? <laughs> or deal with too many issues that are difficult for young readers? <laughs> First of all, I think, uh, you know, anybody who knows me or knows anything about me knows that I would never do anything or say anything to intentionally harm a child. I've spent the last however many years laying my life on the line for these babies, putting everything I have, my mind, body, and soul into everything I've made and then putting my body in every space that they are to let them know just how real it is that I'm not gonna make a product and put it out in the world for you to just buy. I'm gonna come to your school. I'm gonna come to your, to your juvenile detention center. I'm gonna go to the projects and talk to you in the courtyard. I'm coming to your rec center. I'm coming to your libraries. Then it's for years. And so first and foremost, I think it's just such, a, such an extraordinary disrespect uh, and a slap in the face for anyone to say that I or my friends and family, my colleagues, that we would make something. Mind you, we chose this to do the opposite. We chose this because we love kids. I can write whatever I wanna write. This is a choice. I chose this. I choose this every day. I can write whatever I choose to write. I got the same education as everybody else. I can do whatever I want to do. I choose this daily, and so I think first and foremost, I just I feel I don't. The disrespect gets to me, right? It's like, mm, you know, like, like like I think that's that's what what I think that's what what frustrates me uh, the most is that I would never do anything to harm any kid, and I, 
and I hate that that's because that's really what's being said about right it's like it's like oh we don't want you know your books because your books are this that and they're too violent they're too real as if I would ever I'm making it because I know that there are kids in the world who know that these stories are true. Ghost isn't a story that a lot of people have read, right? This is book Ghost. For those of you who haven't read it, this is book Ghost. And and the opening scene of that book, there's a young man whose dad tries to shoot him. And when the book came out, everybody's like, this has never happened. And, and, and I just have to tell people, well, his name is Matt. He lives in Ohio. He grew up down the block from me. I didn't even make it up. Long way down, right? It's a book about something I actually experienced. I know what it is to lose a friend. My friend was murdered, and one of my many friends murdered when I was 19 years old, and I know what it is to go to his mom's house and to me and all my friends and to tell his mother that we will follow the rules and repay to his killer what happened to him. We didn't even know who killed him, but the anger that I felt in that moment is an anger I will never forget. And what's funny about that anger is that the people who are doing all this work to ban my books and my friends' books would consider themselves to be peaceful people who do this, that, and the third, and they want to protect the peace of their children. Here's the thing about peace. It's not really a thing if your peace has never been challenged. Right? It's not an actual thing, right? But for all of you in here who have loved ones, children, Right, I believe you to be peaceful people, but God forbid something happened to your baby, you will meet a new part of yourself because you ain't nothing but a human like the rest of us. And I got to meet that person when I was 19. And a lot of our children have met that person when they're 14, 15 years old. And what we do is because of our fear, we call them gangsters, we call them thugs. Right? We'll do anything we can to call them anything other than a, ch a, a child who is afraid and who lacks the resource because we never gave it to that child. And then we blame the child for not having it. Right? It's not about this idea that like it's, it, it's too real. The world is real. Life is hard. I'm sorry that not everybody is growing up in an environment where it gets a little, where it gets funky, right? I know that some people have it nice, and that's amazing, but the truth is they live in a world where everybody might not be like them. I need them to have enough empathy to not say that so-and-so was a thug because their lives are different. Right, that's a valuable thing. My only job is to help young people become more of who they are, and who they are is fair. I want to protect the fairness by creating space for them to, to be exposed to people and environments that are not like their own so that when they're up against it and their peace is challenged, they can truly tap into that equity, that, fa that, that empathy, that humility, that fairness. And, and, and that could save someone's life, especially if you happen to be a police officer at that time. If you happen to be a teacher at that time. But that's a real thing. This ain't like this idea around literature and, and the books, this, that, and the third. Look, y'all could y'all could talk to the high heavens about the work that I've made, which is just just art, as far as I'm concerned. But stories are human, and because stories are human, this is the we're doing human work. This is about humanity, right? And everybody's trying to turn it into like, you know, this is about narrative. No, this is about your baby growing up to become whole and making sure that the babies that grew up across the track get to be whole too. Right? That's it. Yes. That's all. Can you tell us a little bit about your time as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature? Yeah. It's yeah. a lofty title, by yeah, the way. I know, awesome. right? It's so, it, I know. It's, it's heavy. And, and it was heavy. And you know what? And, and this, I'm glad you asked that because I think this will, this is what separates. <laughs> this is what separates, you know, people who want to censor and, and do all of the, the silly stuff from those of us who actually love these young folks. This is the separation. My ambassadorship came, I was, I was offered the ambassadorship, I took the gig. Reluctantly, because it comes with a lot of work and I don't want to do nothing that I can't do a thousand percent, especially as it pertains to children, because the stakes are too high, right? But I take the job, COVID happens immediately, and I immediately am like, oh boy, what am I going to do now? <laughs> so we make some pivots and we adjust, but when they ask me what my platform was, I said, I only want to go to the places that don't nobody want to go. I want to go to all the small towns. I want to go to the middle of America where city boys like me have been raised to believe are all scary, scary places. The truth of the matter is, they're not. There are places everywhere that's scary. There are people everywhere that are hateful. But the majority of people are, everybody just trying to go to work, take care of their children, come home, pay their bills. Like Everybody minding their business for the most part. 
right? And but I but, but what I understood and what I still am passionate about, there are children there too. There are children in Easley. People say, why are you coming to Easley? Because there are children here. I don't care about what all these people are talking about. It's children here. It ain't no child ever saying nothing to me about the work that I made that is being damaging or bad or anything. <laughs> I ain't never had no baby tell me that, uh, Jason, your work broke me down and made me feel... <laughs> It never happened. Right? I had a little boy in New York City one time raise his hand in a, in a book sign and said, Jason, how come you don't write no white people in your book? And all the adults in the room got immediately uncomfortable. And I said, because there are spaces in the world where black people get to just hang out with, the, with each other and be fine and safe and comfortable. Does that bother you? He was a white boy. I said, does it bother you? And he looked at me and said, why would it bother me? I just said, it's an honest question. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Like, think about that. He's absolutely unconcerned. Unconcerned, right? Well, as we sort of, you know, spiral and do all the things and fight and argue, right? So I'm like, I want to go to all these main, main street towns all over the country. I'm going to go to Montana. I'm going to go to Santa Fe. I'm going to go outside of New Mexico. I'm going to go through Texas. I'm going to be, I mean, like, we were, I mean, we were all over the place. And it was, it, we were down in, yes, down in Alabama. <laughs> Shout out to Alabama. It was a lovely place. Yeah. Down in Georgia, parts of Georgia, right? It was an amazing time, and and what I experienced is the very thing that I wish some of these uh, politicians would would put themselves in position to experience, right? That who you think we are and who we actually are are far, far, far apart. Your idea of me and who I actually am are, are night and day, right? I'm not some boogeyman trying to brainwash your children, right? That's not, that's not what's happening. Please don't believe the hype, right? And, so, and, and in the same way, that easily ain't full of boogie people who got it out for me. It's not true. It's not true. But what happens is we watch the news and just, and just dig our heels in. Right, we hear a thing one once or twice, and we like, oh no, I can't even go down there easily. They, I heard they hate us down there. And I'm like, oh, I've been to easily. Everything was cool with me, right? I've been all through the, I've been all over the country, and I met all kinds of people. I've never met a child that wasn't loving, that wasn't with it, that hadn't read these books and felt connected to me. Never, not one time. Whether it's indigenous indigenous kids. Right through Montana, whether it's whether it's uh, first gen Mexican kids in New Mexico, whether it's white kids in Montana, where there are lots of white people, right? <laughs> and it was love everywhere. And what it did for me was it pushed back against my own stereotypes, my own prejudices. It burned down some of my own feelings and my own fears. I got to go home and tell my 77 year old mom, Ma, I know your fears are real and they come because she's from here. They come from a very real place. But I also want you to know that it's very important for us to make sure that we keep our hearts open, that we allow ourselves the opportunity opportunity, right, and the, poss uh, the possibility that especially with these young people, that there might be something else there, that they might be turning that corner. And if I don't come, I I'd rather come and say, look, no matter what they say about me, you're going to meet me face to face. Now you get to make your judgment now that you met me instead of telling everybody telling you who I am and what I'm about. Um, and we all owe it to each other, by the way, to do that. Everybody, it's okay. We just people. 99% of us is the same, right? We got a couple cultural differences that really we should be we should be sort of talking about and laughing about. Most of them are really funny. I wish <laughs> I wish we weren't so afraid to talk about them all. I think it's that's why I like to make a mess of things. Let's get uncomfortable, right? Like why not? It's not really that deep. And at the end of it, all I'm asking you to do is respect my 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 right to live a free life. That's it. And also, you ain't gotta like me. We, we grown. You have every, if you choose, let me tell you something. I'm done trying to save everybody, change everybody's heart. I don't have the energy nor the time. You have every right to hate me if you feel like it. I don't know why you would ever want to hate, you know. And what does Zora Neale Hurston say? Why would you ever want to, she has this famous quote where she's like, I don't know why you would ever want to excuse yourself from this company. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure, you, you know. But, but you have every right. If you feel like you just hate everything about me, you know what? You have every right to do so. You just don't have the right to get in the way of my freedom and my life. That's it. But if you want to hate me, hate me. Hey, you know, your hate for me ain't none of my business. I ain't got nothing to do with me. Go for it. Just don't get in the way, and we good. Those folks are missing out.
think I'm a good time. These people. If y'all know any of them folks, tell them to invite me over for dinner. We'll have a good time, one way or another. <laughs> one of my favorite things is you talk about how you write not boring books. Yeah. And it's a way for you to engage with, at times, reluctant readers, mm -hmm. especially young men. Mm -hmm. What are some of the books, other than what you've written, that you would consider not boring books? Oh, there's so many of them, especially, I mean, what a time to be alive. Right now, I mean, for the librarians in the room, y'all already know, it's wow right now. You look at everything, and we cooking at the moment. I'm like, man, this is a great time to be working. Sheesh. Um, and I think there's a lot of really, I mean, look, I think, if I was going to look back to maybe 10 years ago, I'd say, I mean, you can't, I can't deny the effect of the crossover. I think like what, what Kwame was able to do with that book, if you don't know Kwame Alexander, won the Newberry for the crossover in 2015. And uh, I can't, that book was able to open up the, the sort of, the literary palette of millions of kids, specifically little boys, uh, because of the way it's written, because of what's it, what it's about. And now the TV show is on, it's great. I don't know if y'all seen it, but the TV show is on Disney, it's amazing, right? I would put that up there. I would put Captain Underpants up there. <laughs> Here's the thing, right? I look, I get, if you're a parent, I understand why it's complicated. Everybody's like, I just don't know. I, I, you know, I meet people all the time, I'm like, I, I, I need my kid to, I, I, they gotta read something. Uh, listen, your kid is reading. When we were growing up, I remember all the kids, I didn't read much, but I remember people around me reading Goosebumps, right? Right, and it's like, oh, you know, and that got a lot of people reading. Like, it doesn't, who cares if it's scary stories or if it's fart jokes, it's, it's got, right? Whatever works, right? Because the, the reality is, is they gotta build a relationship, not with literature, with literacy. It's a game changer, right? that's a true lifesaver. Do your numbers on the prison system and who's illiterate? How many folks who are locked up and incarcerated are, are illiterate or underliterate? So this is important, this is a matter of life or death, their relationship with literacy. So if it's Captain Underpants, let it be Captain Underpants, right? Or Wimpy Kid, or all, those books aren't boring books and it's working, right? Uh, so I, I put all of them in that category. I put some of the fantasy books. I mean, look, there's a lot of good fantasy out there. I think about what Lee Bardugo was able to do with, with Six of Crows and, and Shadow and Bone, and y'all seen it, that? That's a good show too. Wow, but the book, but the book's way better, by the way, way better. Um, I think that what and what Danielle Clayton's doing with the Marvelers, where you're getting like black lore in fantasy, which I think is where it's time for that, right? Where, like we ain't gotta can't all. I always have a thing about dragons. I can't stand dragons. It's like a whole. <laughs> Not because I think anything is wrong with dragons, but because I just feel like, how could every culture write a fantasy book and it be, not all, dragons ain't in all our cultures. <laughs> and we have our own law, and we should lean into our own law. It's okay. That's the beauty of imagination. Every single culture, the beauty of culture, and there's a gazillion of them, right? Every single culture has their own traditions and their own rituals and their own law. So we should just pull from that to create new animals and, and, and you know, monsters and whatever. We have enough of that and all of our pocketed cultures, we don't have to keep using the same thing like Mike Dragons, but Daniel Clayton, <laughs> read the Marvelers, Daniel Clayton got little pit bulls in there, it's amazing, it's, a, it's amazing, a little Rottweilers, it's amazing, um, I think she's writing some great, but there's a lot of, I mean look, if you want some old school stuff, go back and read like, first of all, real talk, and I'm not just saying this, you sh we should all go back and revisit. And even though it's a little, some of the language is out of date and some of the issues are a little bit out of date, just a little bit, but we should go back and revisit some of those Judy Bloom books. I'm gonna tell y'all, I'm gonna tell y'all, sometimes, sometimes people just get it right. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I actually think she's underrated. I think, I think, I, you know what, the, the one I love the most, the one that I read all the time, that I think everyone should be reading right now is called Iggy's House. It's the first one, her first novel. It's like 100 pages, and it's about a black family. This is, by the way, this came out in 1970. She started writing it in 1968 after Dr. King's death. Think about that. Judy Bloom really was like in her bag, right? Like Judy Bloom. And this book is about a black family who moves to an all-white suburb. 
and a little girl who lives down the street who was best friends with the girl who used to live in that house. It is incredible. 100 pages, reading in an hour and a half. And I promise you, it's a book that like, and Judy doesn't actually like the book. She's like a little, she's like a little insecure about the book because she feels like she missed the mark when it comes to the race topic. And then I read the book and I was like, hmm. I actually think that you get the naivete of a child perfectly. Because this little girl don't understand what the fuss is about. She can't understand why everybody is so upset about this family because as far as she's concerned, if they moved into Iggy's house and Iggy was the most special person I ever known, then they gotta be special too. Incredible book, right? You all should check it out. So shout out to Judy Bloom. She still belongs on that category of a person whose books still hold up to this very day. Uh, there's a lot of people going on, but there's tons. Graphic novels, I mean, you gotta, I gotta put Jerry Craft in there. I gotta, I mean, like, you kill it. Like, the new kid books, and he's been banned, of course, too, but yeah. gotta put him in there. There's a lot of people who, who are, are really smoking it right now. What about some advice for maybe some aspiring writers at the middle school level? At the middle school level, first thing you gotta know, uh, for, my, for my youngins who are writing, that if you wake up one day and you're like, writing is really, really difficult, I want you to ask your mom and dad, or whoever in your, whoever is the guardian in your life that teaches, ask them to tell you the truth and, and say, is writing hard for you? And what they will say is yes. Writing is hard for everybody. I know some of the kids are like, wait a minute. Yeah, that's, but they teach it to us. Yeah, they teach it to you. They ain't wrote no five paragraph essay in years. <laughs> this is this is the secret of all secrets. They don't know how to use no semicolon. They don't know. They don't know where the commas go. So they can tell you, right? But the truth is, is that writing is difficult for everybody. Language is a living thing. It changes rapidly. The rules shift rapidly, right? All of us got the basis of it all. But it, it, you know, and, and there's a lot left up to interpretation, especially if you're a creative writer. We love to teach kids about commas, but we never want to talk about the fact that Toni Morrison rarely used them. Right, James Baldwin wrote the longest sentences of all time. You know what I mean? And a whole lot of other people did too, by the way. There's a lot of, y'all ever read a prayer for Owen Meany? The first line of that book is like half the page. <laughs> Brilliant book, by the way. Um, and so I would just say, number one, know that writing is difficult. And that's okay. That's the thing that makes it special. Right? It's difficulty. If any of you know ballerinas, ballet is a hard craft. And that's what makes it special, you know? That, that is the thing, right? So part of it. So don't be afraid of difficulty. And the other thing I'd say is do whatever you want to do. Make a mess of things. And you know, you learn language arts in school, right? That's the class you take. But really in school what you're learning is language. You're not learning art, unfortunately. But this is an opportunity for you to tap into the art part. Do whatever you want to do. If you feel like there will be no commas in this book, or in my story, then there will be no commas in your story. As long as you can explain why. As long as you can be like, hey, I didn't want to put commas because the person speaking is in a moment of distress. <coughs> and commas feel like they get in the way of that. I want to make sure I really create a moment of distress so there's no commas in the book. And I would say, good for you. Good for you, right? If you want to, if you feel like, there's a book written by some famous author, I can't remember the guy's name, who's doing all this experimental stuff back in, I think, the 70s, where he wrote a book where there are no, the letter E doesn't exist in the book. I don't know why, it's just a thing that this person decided to do, right? And they published it, and then we tell a kid that he's not putting his commas in the right place, you know? It's interesting, you know? I think you get to, you get to do what you want, young person, when it comes to writing, especially if you're not, in, if it's outside of your schoolwork, right? When you're not in class, you get to do what you want. Your writing gets to look how, if you want to write in circles around the page, guess what? Do it. That's what you get to do. Because in 20 years from now, they'll call it a concrete poem. <laughs> it's amazing how that works. You know, that, that's, but be fearless with your work. Be fearless with your language. Make up words. Shakespeare did it. Make up words. Do whatever you want to do. Just don't be afraid of the difficulty of writing. That's all. That's so awesome. Well, I think we're gonna go ahead and open things up for some of the younger members who are here who might have questions for Jason. You 
ready? Let's hear it. Was there actually a store where everyone was yelling because this one dude couldn't hear? Because this one dude couldn't hear? Wait, in Ghost? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Mr. Charles. So, okay, so let's talk about Ghost for a second. So, Ghost, uh, there was a store where a man who worked there couldn't hear. Uh, he'd be screaming all the time. You know, and the TV would be turned up too loud. Coach Brody is a real person. His name is Coach Brody. He, he, drove, he drove a cab, he didn't have any hair on his face, looked just like a turtle, just like I described him in the book. And he, and he took care of all the kids who didn't have fathers, just like he did in the book, right? He was one of our, he was a big a big friend of ours. Aaron is a real person, name Aaron. Stoneface Mikey is a real person, name Stoneface Mikey. And all of that, all of that's real. All of that stuff is, for the most part, is real, all those people, for sure. All right? I also got another question. Go for it. You up here with us now. Go for it. <laughs> Have you ever thought about writing like an anime type book? Have I ever thought about writing an anime type book? You know, um, I, it's been coming up a lot lately, so it's a consideration. Just gotta get the right artist. That's all. Because anime is really about like it's about like the art of anime more than anything else. So I just have to make sure that I because I want to respect the craft of anime. That's a long culture and history around that. And I, but I, I could do something like that at some point. I would love to tap into that at some point. What's your favorite anime? I got a feeling you you like anime. One Piece. One Piece? I like One Piece too. One Piece. One Piece is the one he wear that big coat, he wear that like fancy feather coat and all of that. That's One Piece, right? Doflamingo? That's the one. That's the one. So when I start working on my anime, I'm going to come and get you and we're going to put it together so I don't make no mistakes. You know what I mean? Thank you for your question. Spider-Man Miles Morales. How, how did I come up with Spider-Man? You want, this is a good question. Okay, I, I, I only said this for the first time yesterday. I never say this out loud because I'm scared that Marvel gonna be mad. But it is true. So when I was asked to write Miles Morales, uh, I went to the office and they were like, well, what do you think about, what are you gonna do? Who are you gonna, like, what are you gonna create? And my version of Miles Morales is all based on Kevin Durant. <laughs> and it's true. Kevin Durant grew up in a neighborhood, a couple neighborhoods from mine, in an apartment building. We all knew where Kevin grew up. Um, like, how did you come up with him just like shooting spider webs out of his fingers? <laughs> that part is not me. <laughs> I want to I wanna take credit for that, badly, but that part was not me. That was already there when I got there, right? I, I didn't come up with the, the, the spider web. I mean, you know, Peter Parker had the spider thing, too. I had to, certain things they wouldn't let me change. It was up to me. I probably would have come up with something else, honestly. Also, why did you have the name of the book? I can't even read what it's. Which one? Name of the book? Miles Morales? That's his name? No. Oh, the other word? Oh, suspended? It's in like, you know, so the person who, first of all, I don't have nothing to do with the book I was eating. I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I pass the book as often as possible. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make the, the book cover, but they were trying to go for like, old school graffiti, so it makes sense why you would not understand that. And I'm thinking about it, it was probably not the best decision. I gotta, I'll make a call, we'll get it sorted out for you. Did you try drawing for him? Did I try to draw from it? You know what, uh, just recently I was talking to a buddy of mine and I told him that I want to learn how to draw. Uh, if I drew for him, uh, he, he wouldn't look like him, that's for sure. <laughs> do you know how to draw before you walk away? Do you, do you know how to draw? You're working on it? Me too. Me and you are working on it together. I don't know how long you've been writing books. I've been writing books. Uh, I put out my first book independently when I was a 16 year old. I sold it out of the trunk of my mom's car and helped pay my way through college. Got signed when I was 21, and I turned 40 in a couple of months. So about 20, a little over 20 years. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Roman, and what's your favorite movie? Good question. That's a tough question. Roman, I've seen a whole lot of movies. But I, what I, here's what I'll tell you. I'll tell you the movie that has affected me the most over the last five years. And I started watching it during the pandemic. I think it came out during the pandemic. It was, it's called Wendy. 
It's a retelling of Peter Pan. And Peter, a little black boy from like Antigua or something. And it is un. Please do yourselves a favor and watch this film because it does a good job at, at like dancing with like the magic and the reality, the blurred line between magic and reality. You know, like there's like a moment where like Peter's like you can fly and he jumps off the off the cliff and he just lands in the ocean. And then when he gets out of the ocean, he says, "See, I flew under the water." Right? And it's this whole so you have to I mean, that movie and you should watch it too. It is a brilliant film and it's the retelling of Peter Pan. It's called Wendy. Please, please, please find this movie. That, that's probably the one that is resonating the most. And Coco, too. Uh, Those two. Where did you start making books? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, so back in the day, in my mama house, we had this old computer. This was the computer number one. <laughs> and it came with printer number one. <laughs> and you won't believe this, but you used to print on one long piece of paper. The paper could stretch from this side of the room to this, this is true. And you had to go through and rip them apart, little by little. You couldn't tear it, because then you had to you mess up the page. Very careful. Then you had to rip off the borders. So, no, ask somebody, ask one of your, one of your, one of your old folks to tell you. That's how I started. I started in, in a little room with a big, slow computer. And you know what else, you know what else about this time? So like the internet was new, it was a new thing. Right, and it used to cost thirteen dollars a month. Right? And, and in order to use it, you had to wait forty-five minutes for it. It's true, and it sounded like your computer was going to explode. Right? So this is what I had to go through to write my first book. I just want you to know. So I was in my mama's house as twenty-five years ago. What's your favorite book that I've written, or in general? I'm just in general. In general, my favorite book is probably um, a book called Savage the Bones by Jasmine Ward. I think this is the best book. I, I read it once a year. It's an amazing book. Um, that's up there. It's definitely one of my favorite books. And also, I probably read Macbeth way too much. I like a weird thing about Shakespeare, too. I got like a, it's a weird, I got, I got like, I'm not one of those people who hate Shakespeare. I'm like the other way where I'm like, this is amazing. Like, I love Shakespeare. But it would probably be Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward. And for the grown-ups in the room, reading a new book right now, her new book, whoa, like, I, she's the, to me, she's the best of our time. So, Salvage the Bones. In a few years, you'll be ready. What's your favorite food? My favorite food? It's a good question. Now we're getting to the real important stuff. This is a good question. My favorite food is any kind of fish. Now, I don't care what kind of fish. It could be as long as the head is on it. I gotta eat it with the head on the fish. I, I, I know, it's like a thing. I hit my, my theory, I know, you're like, what? Like the head, the head has to be on the fish because in my mind, all the flavor for some reason is up here. I feel like you gotta, you gotta cook it with the head on it. And then there's a, there's a rule in my house with, where if you got good luck, you gotta, this is gonna sound like I'm lying to you, but I'm not lying. But for good luck, you gotta eat the eyeballs. That's, Child like everybody else. My issue, can I tell you my issue with T'Challa? And I love T'Challa. But I feel about T'Challa the way I feel about, not all the way, but similar to how I feel about Batman. Right? I know it's kind of, but here's the thing. T'Challa just rich. <laughs> to see black people rich, right? I'm like, this is great to see like African men. He got everything from like this beautiful place. Wakanda's amazing. They got all the latest technology. They got vibranium. They got all the stuff, right? And that is amazing to like visualize. Like, oh, this is amazing. But like when I think about like his superpower, it's just because he is because he because he is rich. He, he got everything, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like Batman, like what's Batman's superpower? He just mad and rich, right? That's it. You know what I'm saying? Um, and 
so that's my I love the challenge, but like that's my one hic- my one hiccup is that there's no inherent like superpower. There is no I mean he takes the purple juice, right? But he gotta take the purple juice. <laughs> well really the purple juice should be living in his body. It should be in his blood. The purple juice should be his blood. And then the rest of the world should be trying to get his blood. To me, that's the story right now. You feel me? Like, because that's closer to reality, right? I'm like, that's the story. And instead it's like drink this juice and then you go on they get you know you too young to know what the, the, the gummy bears cartoon was. <laughs> You gotta drink the gummy berry juice and then they become like another kind of animal, right? Yeah, they start bouncing and all kind of like, Don't worry about it, dude. <laughs> Wolverine is my answer. What's your answer? Iron Man. Iron Man, another rich person. <laughs> he ain't got no power, just rich. <laughs> but that's fair, I'm with you. Thank you for your question. For sure. So why did you end Long Way Down on a cliffhanger? Uh, when when kids, when, when young people read the book, I wanted to put them in a situation where they would have to activate their imaginations. If I give you the answer, if I tell you the answer, it's because I don't respect your intellect. I don't respect your capacity to reason and think through what you think might be the case, right? You can't expect me out of gate 250 pages, bro. <laughs> I'm asking you to write one, to think of one, right? And, 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 the re- and the reason why is because if your imagination is shot by the time you're 16, we're doomed, all of us. I need you to be able to consider everything you read and to make a decision, and there's no wrong answer. Whatever decision you make, there's evidence there to back it up. You can't get it wrong, just make a decision, because life is about making decisions, right? The other reason I wrote it that way is because I knew a bunch of adults would be reading it too. And I wanted to put them in the trick bag. Because the truth of the matter is, is that Will Holloman is in everybody's classroom. They in your, he in your neighborhood, right? He at your local grocery store. He bringing you up at the dollar store. He everywhere around you. And you have an opportunity to choose his fate. And if you choose his death, that's strange. If you're around young people every day, that you have the possibility of saving him. You could have easily chose that he went back upstairs and went on with his life, grieved and broke the, broke the chain and moved forward. But if you are an adult and you chose to send him off that elevator, you should probably ask yourself some questions about your biases. Honestly, right? And I wanted to put adults in the, in, in the hot seat a little bit. It's okay. I'm not saying that you're not a bad person, but this is a, a moment where you have to check yourself and be like, I could have just as easily saved him. Why did I choose? to send him off there. So those, that's the reason why. One, because I wanted adults to kind of be messed up, you know what I mean? And two, because I wanted y'all to sort of activate that part of you that everybody's trying to kill, which is your imagination. All right? Mm. Fair enough? Mm. All right. I like your sneakers. Besides you with, man. <laughs> There's only one answer. I'm gonna give you some game right now. Besides you with? Hey, all right, my man. <laughs> smoke you say your size <laughs> don't say that unless you want that kind of heat yo. <laughs> all right <laughs> so continue on to his question uh what would you have done in that situation not doing it <laughs> oh, no 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 you know you think you're the first person to ask that <laughs> no i vow to never ever ever give my opinion and to be honest to be completely honest with you to me the story ends very nice i didn't think of i don't for me, when I'm writing books, when the last page is literally the last page, the next page does not exist in my head. It's not there for me. You know what I mean? Honestly, it's it's blank. So I don't actually have an answer. I'd be lying to you if I made something up. Yeah. What is your worst fear? Um, my worst fear is probably at this particular moment in my life. My worst fear is probably uh, getting to the end. You know, getting to the end of this journey and feeling like I lived my dream and never lived my life. Oh. Yeah. That's me. Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> it's rough. It's rough. It, got, it got deep, I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, you asked. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Is that it? Are we all done? Oh, it happened so fast. Well, let me just say to all of you here, um, you know, it's a, I, I got a lot of love for you, and I'm not, um, it's it's a it's a loud minority. It's a loud minority, and we all know that. Uh, I want to shout out the librarians. I think the librarians are the people that we should be studying. The reason why the reason why 
because what librarians understand that the rest of us need to understand is that you don't have to agree with the book. You don't have to like it. It might not be your jam. And it still deserves to live on that shelf.